What's it all about? Why are we here? Is there a God? What happens when we die? In this series, I'm talking to public figures about these questions. Like me, few of them claim to be religious experts, but all of them have, at times, had cause to think about the meaning of life. Our guest this time is Edna O'Brien, and thank you, Edna, for joining us. Let me start by asking you to tell me about your early beginnings, your childhood, your parents and your family in Chumgraney. Well, that would take a, a book in itself. My childhood was in a very lovely house, stone house in the middle of a field with every kind of trees. And there was a very, very pervasive sense of religion. Religion was everywhere. It wasn't a house of harmony, but it was perhaps a house where I learned something about the necessity to write. I thought then, and I still think it, that literature is spiritual, that literature is a way, if you like, of making ordinary life more bearable, in contrast to the tears or rows or all else that I also saw. My father was unlucky in that he was one of those people who shouldn't drink. He was a great storyteller, but he was a man with a high temper, high volatile temper. My mother, in contrast to my father, was a much more hardworking woman. I never saw my mother not working, feeding hens, feeding calves, pounding meal, making cakes, making the house right. I get the impression that you loved your mother, you were wary of your father, would that be right? That would be wary. very accurate. But, but was it a happy childhood for you? No, 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 it wasn't because I was full of fear. And where there is fear, there isn't happiness. Jumping way ahead, did you eventually forgive your father for this? I do forgive him. I do forgive him. Before he died? Absolutely. I just didn't want to be in that place. Uh, fear doesn't rule out forgiveness. And your mother, you loved your mother, did you? I loved my mother, and she was a wonderful woman, very intelligent woman. I was her last child and I was, people think of me as a rebel, well, God help us, I was very biddable. And anything my mother wanted, if I thought I should fast, let us say, or drink salted water, I was full of, you know, penance and religion. I know you're laughing, but it's the truth. If I thought, I associated my mother with the Virgin Mary and with divinity and with purity and all those words, so I was obedient to the point of, of cravenness. When I began to feel that I might like to kiss a, a man or a boy or go to a dance and that, her possessiveness of me, her stranglehold on me became more and more apparent. So I had a lot of judgment in my life. I had the judgment of my mother. Oddly enough, my father did not judge me. He didn't, but my mother did, and of course, the, the church, the nuns, priests, everyone. It is only later that I come to truly distinguish between religion and spirituality. Religion is very often coercive in any faith, Muslim, Jewish, or Catholic, and uh, Irish Catholicism was great at it. You know, most of the enjoiners were, do not, do not, do not, do not. Not love of God, but fear of God. What about books? Was it a reading house in any way? No, there weren't any books. There was, as I've often said, this copy of Rebecca that circulated in the village. Some woman had brought Rebecca. In the village? In the village. And the book was loaned by the page, but not consecutive. 
So you got page 104 and then you got page two. Well, everyone wanted to read it. So he tore out the pages of the book and said, well, you have that page, but it wasn't like one, two, three. I longed for books. We had some essays of uh, great writers, not our greatest Irish writers, but great English writers, snatches of Shakespeare, uh, the Gospels, as I said, and some myths. I would learn these things off by heart. I would recite them coming home from school. I would write other girls' compositions, you know, a day at the seaside not having been to the seaside, or a day in the life of a penny, and so on. And my own mother, from a very early age, was deeply suspect of this vocation, because I call it a vocation, that I had for that, for writing. So let's so. move on then to the Sisters of Mercy in Loch Ray. And did, was, was that a happy time for you? Uh, it was punitive, but in some ways it was more peaceful. There wasn't, uh, I missed my mother terribly. When I wrote The Country Girls, which, uh, chapters of which are really, of course, Based, not based on, but stimulated by, and the actual backdrop is the convent I was in. The head nun, Sister Teresa, wrote to me and said, we hear you have written a novel. We give credence an open mind. Well, I was shaking, because I knew she wasn't giving credence an open mind. And they were very uh, upset by my book. Well, everyone was upset. I was not sorry to be leaving the old village. It was dead and tired and old and crumbling and falling down. The shops needed paint and there seemed to be fewer geraniums in the upstairs windows than there had been when I was a child. Now, only a girl born and reared in a small Irish town could have written that. Yes. And, and it was from the heart and you had determined, I'm getting out um, of here. Yes, and there's an anger in it. Yes. There's an anger in it. And that's part of youth. Of, 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 of breaking out, one wanted, I wouldn't write that now, not because I would want, wish to placate people, but at that point in time, and I don't know when I wrote it, which book it's from. It's uh, the Country Girls. It's The Country Girls. That's what I felt. I saw this world as crumbling, worn, dead, imaginatively dead and I wanted out. Now, it wasn't imaginatively dead, because there were people unknown to me, living, suffering, dreaming, cursing, hating, uh, praying, but uh, I only spoke for my own incentive. Now, let, let's move on to The Country Girls and wh when it was published, and is it true that the parish priest burned a copy of it? It did. They did, but it was in Scarif. In Scarif. There was two villages, two Graney and Scarif. So, they so, did. It so, has since so, been... Does that make a difference? Not, that, oh, yes, <laughs> from the point of view of accuracy, <laughs> yes. But the burning did happen, and we have to remember, in those times, it was 1960, it, County Clare or any other county wasn't the most culturally enlightened. Nowhere was, nowhere was. I mean... Charlie Hawhey, who later claimed to have be, a, you know, to like me, he and the Archbishop of Dublin had an exchange of letters about the country girls that's laughable, that it shouldn't be let any in any decent homestead, that it was filth and so on. They all thought that I had fouled, you know, girlhood and childhood. I had a smear, the same phrases that once had been said about J.M. Singh, apparently it's in the vernacular, a smear on Irish womanhood. But uh, there was the little burning. because uh, The priest asked, a couple of women had bought the country girls, to show you what big sales I have, okay? And he asked that the books be brought in, and the women brought them in, and there was the burning. My mother didn't attend the burning, but naturally she told me. And I was quaking. I thought, oh, God. Where were you at this stage I now? was in England. <laughs> you'd, you'd done I'd a run. I had gone. I had scooted. Uh, uh, again, fear and self-preservation both. I was thought by many, by many, to have done something treacherous to my own people and my own country. 
Whereas within me, what I was trying to do, not something pretty or prettifying or appeasing, I was trying to render in the best language that I could search for in my mind, the reality and the comedy and the sorrow as I saw it and more, much more importantly as I felt it around me. So between what I felt I was doing and what was perceived as what I was doing, there was a great gulf. Were, were you were you conscious of people staring at you or pointing the finger or that's the one oh, who wrote this book? And ah, yes. Ah, yes, of course, and more. And what did you do about that? How did you cope with it? I don't think I was that brave. My only bravery was to write the next book. And I remember getting anonymous letters, you know, uh, drowning in your own sewerage and so on and so on. Well, go back to your mother again. How did she cope with this? What did she do with the book? And well, she buried she it. She buried, um, you know, bolster case. I dedicated the book to my mother. And do I you mean physically buried it? Yes, it was in a, well, out in a turf house. She, my mother went through the book with black ink. I only found this after she was dead. And honestly, I could have killed her. She went through, and you know, Baba's given to the expletives. And I, I, I can't remember what she did about Mr. Gentleman's semi-nakedness. She must have had a seizure at that moment. That in black ink, she'd gone through any wor offensive words. So after my mother's death, I found the country girls outside in a turf house. And it was in a bolster case, wrapped up, wrapped up, wrapped up. Love. Secret. Secret and sinful. Where, where were you spiritually at this stage in relation to the Catholic oh, Church? I, you were now spirit. married to a divorced man. Oh, exactly. Well, I had erred and fallen, if you like, mm. to having become wedded to um, a divorced, married to a divorced man in, at a very grim little wedding. It was in the sacristy of a Catholic church in Blanchardstown. And the witnesses were the two builders. Well, this must have been love. I'm not sure, Gay. Okay. I had burned my boats by going with the man I later married. My own family pursued us and were violent, actually, towards my future husband. And I knew I wasn't married then, I was just living with him. I knew at that, that evening when he had wounds and was livid with What do you me. mean he had wounds? Well, there was a fight. Ah. So he was hit or kicked by... By whom? Well, my father came with a priest. Ah. It was like something out of the Middle Ages, you know, as if I were... It was the same as if I were a witch, but instead of being a witch, I was a fallen woman. But anyhow, there was fisticuffs with Ernest Gabler, which naturally I was very ashamed of. I had no power over or no ability to redress. But by then, I knew that I had cast my lot, and I had and there was no going back. He must have loved you. I think he did. Yes. He was very... Uh, I think he, he did love me, but he also determined to completely control me. Right. Now, in Eleonora, in the light of evening, yes. you describe finishing your book in the jotters, on the window ledge. You've done it, you've finished yes. that. And he comes in and you describe a most horrendous scene of hatred, resentment. Jealousy. Jealousy. Yes. Of your writing ability. Yes. Is that a, as it was? Yes, absolutely. He could not bear the thought that you had written a book and, it, and a good book. It undermined him. It undermined his own sense of himself, his own gifts. This is very sad. It's very sad for him too, he's dead. But this is very sad, but that is the truth. He said, you can do it, meaning, right. 
and I will never forgive you. Did he influence your spiritual beliefs or values or theology in any way, your husband? Well, he was very uh, opposed to, you know, he said I came from ignorant peasants and that. I did come from peasants and they had some ignorance, but they also had great stock and they had great determination, which thank God I have some of. He didn't put me off God. If anything, he'd put me slightly more on God because I hate people telling you how you must think, how you must feel, even though I have, if you like, been subservient to it. Where do you stand now in relation to the Catholic Church? I shall now do my Joan of Arc. Mm. I saw some of the blatant hypocrisy of the Catholic Church of saying, you do that, but I can do what I like. That's not religion. That's not spirituality. The power of the Catholic Church in the 40s, 50s, 60s uh, in Ireland and maybe long after was overwhelming. It is less so now because people have become, if you like, a little more they're asking questions, they're more enlightened, and in many ways they're more angry because they feel the Catholic Church has let them down. I don't feel the Catholic Church has let me down because it was never intending to build me up. So what I feel is that whatever relationship, including my fears, fears and my hopes, uh, if you like, are with my maker and with myself. I know some wonderful devout Catholics. I know a nun in the Mater Hospital who gave me so much help with the light of evening with that book, who nursed my mother in her final and most troubled moments. That nun has, her, not like some of the nuns who taught me, that nun has given her life to God. So her stronghold will be towards God and not towards this or that bishop or priest. Do you pray? I do pray, of course. To whom do you pray? I pray to God and a divinity. I pray to, uh, in my little venal ways or whatever you might call them, I pray to St. Anthony. But the but prayers one says must come, the way writing must come, from the soul and from the heart. They can't be robot. It's not robot time. It's too late on this earth for robot time. The world is too troubled and troubling. What vision do you have in your mind when you're praying to him? Well, it's subjective. Uh, I'm very frightened in life. Uh, so when I'm praying to him, I would think I become something of a child. Mm -hmm. It's between me and the person to whom I am appealing, whom I am not even sure exists. So in there lies, if you like, a whole crop of paradoxes. Do you think prayers are answered? I do. I think an intensity of prayer is answered. I do actually. Now, I can't say that's happening, like I would like to own a house in London. I don't think I'm going to get a house in Dublin or in London before nightfall. But if I do, let me assure you, I will telephone you. You have not been lucky with the men in your life, your dad and your husband, and is that a fair statement? Very precise. A fair statement and one that will dwell on for a moment or two. I have not been lucky. Certainly in the case of the Ernest Gabler, I chose uh, a judgmental or punishing uh, figure. Uh, not obviously religious, in fact irreligious, but with the same strictures. Some people call it masochism. I object to the word. I think in me was um, religion had been so instilled into me that I did not 
think or feel that earthly love should be anything but in some form um, punishing. I didn't feel it should be a romp. And now I am 78 years of age. I haven't met the man with whom my whole being, heart, soul, and body would be in, miraculously entwined. I didn't. My prayer has not been answered in that, nor is it likely to be. Do you believe you'll see your parents again? I am frightened to. Now, I would love to be able to say to you, I would love to see my parents, because when I die, I hope my children will not only want, will not only not be afraid, but will be longing to see me. There were things left unfinished, and in my little uh, understanding of it, which again is just like a fable in my mind, those unfinished things would have to be thrashed out, and I would be nervous of that. Do you not think the communion of saints theology and the Catholic Church is a very nice, comforting kind of theology? It certainly is, so long as one can totally believe it. You see, again, it's a question of faith. If, if let's say, 100% faith, like the nun I love in St. Martin's Hospital, who has the great name of Reparata, uh, she has total faith. I do not have total faith. Do you envy her that faith? No, I, I still want to be me. The feeling of the love of God, the absolute love of God, at whatever age or years I felt it, is something I am glad to have felt. But where it got destroyed was that it was intermeshed with such fear and with hell. Hell as opposed to heaven. Hell and purgatory took precedence. Do you fear death? I fear death and I fear the journey towards death. Everybody balks at the word nothingness. And I balk too, but I don't know whether it's nothingness. or And those who tell us, Richard Dawkins and many people, they don't know either. Shakespeare's great line, from whose hilly bourne no traveller returns to tell us of the way. Were you ever attracted to another faith? Muslim, Hindu, Protestant, Jew? There is something about the, the best of Buddhist faith that is also the best about human humanity. But as regards crossing over, or taking the soup, as it used to be called, <laughs> I don't think I could do that because the other was so ingrained in me. What do you think the Old Testament is? Well, I think it's great literature, but it does stretch the imagination. Seven days, you know, it takes people seven days to deliver a pizza. Seven days to create the world. And what do you think Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is? The evangel they, the disciples of Christ, I believe, were in, were in an epoch, I, I don't know the exact dates, in which a man called Jesus lived and was crucified and rose from the dead. Do you think he was God, the Son of God? That's where I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that is what the teaching is, that it is the but Son what, of God. What do you believe? I want to believe that he was. Do you believe in the real presence in at Mass? Very often I am so distracted at Mass by the noise and coughing, and it's like kindergarten now, uh, in the presence of, of Christ in the host, I, I suppose I do believe in it, but I cannot uh, logically uh, 
tell you. I believe in it because I believed in it at first. One last question. Yes. Suppose it's all true and you meet Jesus when you arrive at the pearly gates. What will you say to him? Bless me. Bless me throughout eternity. Thank you. <laughs>